Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today has been described as India's, one of India's most distinguished scientists. Though he's an astrophysicist by vocation, he's applied the scientific temper to a whole range of social and economic issues. He's currently the director of the National Institute of Science, Technology and Development Studies. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Rajesh Kocha. Thank you. You were an astrophysicist by uh, training, by vocation for many years in Bangalore, and yet amongst your most recent books has been one on the Vedic people. Uh, I, I still remember in 1980, uh, there was a news item in Times of India. There was excavation done in Ayodhya, and the heading of the news item was Ramayana is later than Mahabharata, according to. It's a very well-known archaeological fact that Mahabharata named sites are older than Ramayana named mm -hmm. sites archaeologically. And the thought struck me, it can't be so. If mythology says Rama is prior to Krishna, there's no reason for mythology to, to life. Mm -hmm. So I started looking uh, at it, at the problem. So first I looked at Ramayana, Mahabharata, then Puranas, and then we found that Puranas are not very dependable. You must go to the Vedic corpus. When you go to the Vedic corpus, you find that Rig Veda is associated with Avesta, so you should look at that also. So it has been like a backward integration. Mm -hmm. And it was a very educative exercise because I learned the subject while writing the book. See, very often people work in a discipline for many years to come and then write a book. Mm -hmm. Here the idea of the book came first. So then an aspiration of this, of this book for someone uh, so steeped in science uh, was to bring scientific method uh, into analysis. Yes. Because you said that there is no reason for mythology to lie. But, but over history and, and, and in centuries and decades of uh, evolution, very often mythology is adapted to political impulses. So how do you reconcile uh, a belief that mythology doesn't lie with perhaps the empirical discoveries of science? You see, at any given time, there is some knowledge which people consider to be scientific knowledge, although the, the term is a modern term. And I don't think any mythology would contradict what was considered to be the material knowledge at that time. There's so much of uh, uh, you know, conflict uh, between religions and, and, and aspects of tradition uh, draws upon this aspect of, of, of historical um, accuracy or, or, or um, the, the, the empirical notion that you know, there was a temple here or there was a masjid here or not uh, seems to uh, assume larger than life proportions. So what is the role of scientific method uh, in, 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 in these areas? See, my, my own belief is, see, history is a very difficult subject to study. It's much easier to study science, for example. And the reason is very simple. You see, scientific forces of nature act the same way on all the particles, for example. You take one particle, study its behavior, and you know it's typical of the whole system. But when you're looking at historical events, it's not possible to say how typical uh, a historical event is. So, so when you interpret historical evidence, you have to have a framework. But as a student of science, first and foremost, there should not be any dispute on the event itself. Dispute should be on its significance. And the fact does remain that throughout history, history has been used to legitimize the current contemporary issues. That, that, that's a fact of life. Mm -hmm. Like kings have tried to trace their lineage back to Sun and Jupiter and Raghuvanj uh, when the British set up empire. They sought legitimacy by treating the Greek as the origin of the civilization. They wouldn't look at pre-Greek origins because that would take them, uh, bring them into Asia or Africa. 
Isn't it sort of somewhat ironical, and, and this is something that you have articulated, that the um, Archaeological Survey of India, a scientific uh, enterprise, and ought to be a scientific en enterprise, really comes under the Department of Ministry of Culture rather than that of science. What, uh, is this, what are the implications of this, you think? Uh, I think it should be shifted. I think Archaeological Survey of India should be shifted to Ministry of Science and Technology. Because archaeology provides evidence which, which is the touchstone, for, for which, which defines the framework for interpretation of historical evidence. So, so the, the, the detachment and the objectivity, the rigor of archaeological evidence is best achieved by decoupling it from culture. Mm -hmm. Let culture people, let history people use archaeological evidence. Mm -hmm. But archaeological evidence should stand on its own. Mm -hmm. It should have that rigor. Mm -hmm. And my worry is uh, loss of rigor, loss of scientific credibility is a very big loss. We are used to historians fighting with each other. As a student of science, I would not like archaeological evidence to be brought into disrepute because that loss would be very great. Professor Kocha, uh, you have applied uh, scientific method to, to many areas. Uh, the, um, you've been responsible for setting up a museum for Dokra art. Uh, what is the application of science here in, in, in an ancient artistic tradition? See, see, Dokra art is a very ancient, is the most ancient uh, craft of metal casting with a lost wax technique. And originally it was in the hands of the tribal people because the tribal people were the one who lived where minerals were. Then two things have happened. Uh, other people have picked this craft from tribal people and it has been formalized in South India uh, like these famous Chola bronzes are made by the same technique. For, uh, for our institute happened to have uh, field station in Bankura. That is how we came into contact with these people. And uh, there's, a, there's a continuation of probably 5,000 years in this craft in India. And these people are extremely poor. And it occurred to us that we should be obliged to these people they're, that they are preserving this craft against heavy odds. Because if they were to give it up, the loss would be humankind's. You know, very often there is a popular perception that uh, you know, the processes of uh, modern production, the processes of science, uh, actually end up diluting uh, traditional arts, crafts, and handicrafts in many ways. So what kind of interventions are you looking for uh, that will actually reinforce that tradition? You see, it's not, you, there is a danger of, for, overwhelming them. If I use the concept of an equilibrium state, if you, if you, modif if you take them along, see, if any traditional craft has survived, it must have undergone change. So what we are looking for is continuity embedded in change. So we are not interfering with their art, art form. A Dokra craftsman is an artist first. He first makes his icon in wax. That is why these Chola bronzes have such vitality, such fluidity, because it's in wax. And then you replace wax with molten metal. So we are trying to help them with improving their metallurgy, improving their casting techniques. We are not interfering with their artwork. Mm -hmm. We are telling them if you use this furnace, it would be better. And these people have no concept of measurement. If they make a four leg thing, it's not necessary that the, those four legs will be on a plane. But is it important and useful to, to introduce this notion of measurement uh, into their creative processes and, and might it not intrude in their imagination? No. They are very poor uh, and they like it. It's, it's not that we are forcing it upon them. I'll give you an example. I went to this village in Bankura and I asked, this artifact was shown my, to me by the Shilpi. I said, is it good? He says, no. 
I said, what's wrong with it? He says, it's burnt here, it's broken here. I said, why did you make it? He says, what can we do? We are paid so little. And he, he knew what was wrong with it. So this assumption that traditional artists are static, are fossilized is wrong. Our aim is not to overwhelm them. You have been a critic of uh, globalization using, again, scientific method and, and empiricism. Uh, in some ways, it seemed almost a contradiction because we have come to associate uh, globalization with the modern, with the contemporary, uh, as we do with, uh, with science. And you know, you've just been looking at Dokra art, which also, in 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 some ways, uh, uh, is, is is seen as the victim of globalization, of of, of, of mass production, of standardization. Um, what is your primary critique uh, of the impact of uh, globalization? No, no, in first India? of all, globalization has its virtues. Like uh, we have set up, as you mentioned, a Dokra museum. Now we are setting up a virtual museum on the net. And one way of helping this Dokra craftsman or any craftsman is to make use of internet fi for finding them international mm, customers. Because after all the work which they are doing belongs to the humankind as a whole. So it's not that I'm against globalization. But uh, you have argued that uh, you know, globalization has created, you used the wonderful phrase, techno coolies. Uh, you have argued that the uh, Indian economy uh, isn't able to, as a whole, uh, sustain globalization and it is creating, uh, it is really sustaining the elites. I what kind yes. of, what kind of processes have you used to arrive at these I, conclusions? I, see globalization is inevitable, but I think India is yielding more ground than was necessary. Like globalization asks you to bend, there is no reason for you to crawl. And the point which I have made as it happened in India, globalization took place, started at about the same time as mandalization. Mm -hmm. And mandalization involves transfer of power to middling caste, which had so far been marginalized. And more so, loss of space for the upper castes in the classroom has been a very devastating thing for them. And so the upper castes are using globalization as a pretext to decouple themselves from the rest of the country. And of all the aspects of globalization, the one which our middle class has liked the most is access to consumer goods of uh, Western standards. Indian economy can't sustain that standard of living. And two things are happening. One is there is a tremendous drain on national economy through fifth pay commission, through, through corruption, through so privatization of education, lack of space in, in classroom. Uh, all these things uh, people require money. And that money is not available through legitimate, legitimate means. The other thing which we are doing is to do petty jobbery for the West. The techno coolies. Uh, yes, I think techno babu is a better phrase than techno coolie mm -hmm. because see, there is a certain amount of insult in coolie and you may react. Mm -hmm. Like the British called Gandhi a coolie in South Africa and see what happened to the empire. But a babu is happy with the term, so he doesn't tr revolt. So I, I, I would prefer to use the term techno babu than techno kuli. See, it's a, it's a remarkable thing that our unlettered, semi skilled workers, uh, which go to the Gulf, who go to the Gulf, are sending in almost as much money as our IT services are earning. And our most IT professionals are underemployed. And to me, globalization should mean that people with equal qualification anywhere in the world should be earning more or less the same amount. Mm -hmm. So I think one aspect of globalization which worries me is the decoupling of the middle class from the rest of the country. And if a country loses the service of its middle class, I don't think it can have much of a future. And educated people, skilled people, 
should earn their living through science and technology. And unfortunately, S and T is ceasing to mean science and technology and is coming to mean more and more services and trade. So maybe I'm old fashioned. Mm -hmm. I just like to go back to this, uh, this, this idea of uh, if you're being an astrophysicist by training and spending uh, so much of your life as being a distinguished scientist, traveling the world, lecturing, writing papers, and then suddenly you begin to look at uh, issues which are not in, in that sense pure science. Why? It happened by chance. Uh, I'll tell you how it began. Very many years ago, uh, our director in Bangalore felt that we should have a brochure. So this is the National Institute of Science? I Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to prepare a brochure. So I thought the first section of the brochure should be the brief history of the institute. And it was known that our institute was set up by East India Company in the 18th century. So when I started looking at the history, I found that uh, there was hardly any information. So I, I went deeper and deeper into it. And it became a research topic, it became a research problem. In fact, I was able to make corrections in even gazetteers which had been brought out in 1905 and so on. So from history of modern astronomy to history of modern science in India, sociology of science, that became one passion. Did you somehow feel that uh, science in India was, uh, was removed, was isolated, didn't address uh, everyday uh, issues and predicaments? That is a striving of, of the institute uh, that you now head uh, to see that how uh, the public discourse in science could be intensified, people become more sensitive to the issues of science. You know, Nehru talked about the imperative of cultivating the scientific temper where do we stand today? I think, see, if you take any indicator, standard indicator, like number of papers published, there is certainly stagnation in Indian scientific output. There's no doubt about it. But my greater worry is science education. Mm -hmm. And I would judge a country not so much by its research output as by the quality of its science textbooks. And I have a feeling that five years from now, you will not have people to teach science at high school or plus two level. And secondly, there's not only decline in science education and science research, there's decline in scholarship in general also. So, so why is this so? Why people are not interested in science is a, is a serious matter. So why do you think uh, this is the case? You know, what, is it, what, what is your aspiration uh, for science in, 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 in India, both in terms of education, in terms of its ability uh, to accelerate processes of development, eradicate I, poverty? I think we should pay most attention not to scientific research but to science education, right from school. Because by the time uh, students come for research, uh, it's already too late. Today, India has an advantage. India has very good facilities in new biology. And the uh, new biology is the research area for the next two or three decades. And India is pretty good in that. But, uh, uh, you know, aren't, aren't we handicapped by the fact that, you know, very often uh, science is, is seen as an antithesis uh, to tradition? I don't think so. I don't think there's any contradiction between science and tradition and I, I, I don't think scientific progress uh, is affected by emphasis on tradition. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. How would you describe this, this, this Nehruvian phrase of the scientific temper? What is the scientific temper? Frankly speaking, I'm not too enamored of the phrase. I don't think we need scientific temper. What we need is education. What we need is use of science in production of wealth. We need science in governance, in dispensation of justice, and people respect science. But uh, even today, Indian economy, Indian political stability depends on monsoon. So when you, when you depend on nature for political stability, for your economic 
well-being people tend to be fatalistic so i don't think scientific temper needs to be taught as an add on if production of wealth in india depended on science and technology if governance depended on science and technology people will develop what has been called a scientific temper to what degree do you think uh, science is in that sense a moral in the relationship of science to the cultivation of values the two different things science has no morality of its own i i'll give you an example which is not very well known see there was a committee in us which decided to drop nuclear bombs on japan the committee had two scientists in it there was only one person in that committee which opposed dropping of the bomb and that one person was not a scientist and i think that person was under secretary for navy so it was a military man who is opposing dropping of bomb while scientists are supporting dropping of bomb so human values or the ethical framework which a society has is not in built into science so science is like a picture which has to be framed within that ethical framework which society provides science itself cannot provide that framework so this and this ethical dilemma has become very important now because of new biology see earlier when there was an ethical problem in science it was man against man my patriotism is your devastation for example but now it is man against god man against nature like cloning modification of life um, at uh, molecular level so do you say that the ultimate final triumph that of science or of god yes of science or of god are they in opposition no i was using god in a very loose sense mm-hmm. uh, the best word would be to use nature mm-hmm. science is setting up human beings against nature now because the first time human beings are in a position to modify the very building blocks of nature building blocks of life nobody knows what it would lead to what is man's place in this what is your place in this in in, in this scheme scheme of god nature science i i you see when if god suppose is god god made the universe if he had wished he could have put a neon sign saying beware i am here he would have put he could have incorporated into the genetic code of human beings belief in god it doesn't happen so god has given some territory to human beings and left them alone it doesn't interfere in that territory so in other words human beings have to conduct their affairs themselves there's no divine intervention and the ethical framework uh, do we have time i would like to make well, a well we just got 30 seconds to wind up <laughs> i'm sorry okay uh-huh. you see human beings to deal with each other need an ethical framework without an ethical framework which is imposed on all human beings we wouldn't know how to deal with each other what to expect from human beings so a civilizational ethical framework is important to define science the more so because globalization has meant retreat of state throughout the world so so earlier state was looking after civilizational interest to an extent thank you very much this yeah. looked only like yeah. the beginning of a wonderful conversation yeah. it's been thank a great honor talking to you thank yeah. you very much